Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Eshtal Cycling Podcast, where three nerds discuss, well, three cycling nerds and nerds, I guess, discuss uh, what's been happening in the week of cycling and, yeah, the rumblings of the sport, despite it being the winter season. And as always, I'm joined by Patrick Blake of Audi Cycling and Mr. Berger himself, Ewan Wilson. I mean, before we start, a bit of behind the curtain last week, I had an absolute disaster uh, editing this thing in Cali in Colombia right now. And uh, yeah, when your charger of your laptop breaks for whatever reason, then I had to find out, I had to race halfway across the city to try and get a, a new one and then sat in a Colombian mall editing the episode. But that's just a bit of a side note. And uh, Hollison Bentano is from this city and I didn't know this. He owns 106 cycling shops in Colombia. So he definitely spent his four years away from the sport. I'm very proactive. Wait, 106? Yes. I thought he had one. I thought he had one in Cali. Well, there you go. That's how you spend four years suspension out of the sport. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You build up a bike shop empire. Bam. Wait. Like that is, everyone. Well, I'll try and uh, get uh, a bit of a... I'll go to one of them and then we can feature that in the next one. But we have a lot to discuss on the agenda. But, well, I wanted to start Cyclocross, but then we are not going to hear you and talk for 10 minutes. So we can start with the, the team kits that we've been talking about for the last two episodes. We've got some new ones coming out as well. Visma and Lisbag obviously had their big presentation as well. Do you want to start with Visma? That feels like the right place to start. So Visma and Lisbag releasing their kit, we kind of discussed them last week uh, because we saw the bottles and the socks were leaked. And the full kit has now been announced. It is a yellow number, more yellow than they have ever been before. But there's no black stripe through the center. The Visma logo is now higher than it was before. And they have this sort of hexagon feature throughout, well, the hexagon effect throughout the bottom half of the jersey. Uh, despite the fact Visma's colors are not yellow, they, they've gone with that. And we also heard rumors during the week, according to our Dutch language sources, that the team were going to like rebrand and have this like tagline of the yellow bees. That was going to be that their like team name, a bit like the Wolf Pack for Sudar Quickstep. We don't know if that's going to happen, but the whole beehive um, aesthetic on the jersey and the yellow color scheme definitely looks like they're they're keeping this, and they've noticed the team identity. We can already see as well in their press stuff uh, for the next year is that Jonas Vehicle, his yellow jersey journey, and the yellow jersey in itself, very on the nose. But the Visma Lisa bike seems to go hand in hand. It just makes me think about what the Tour de France kit will look like because this is like the big thing which comes around every year. It's what EF, well, depending, we don't know what their kit looks like, but they always have to grapple with that with the Giro. And it's a good way because they can kind of, it's a little like PR stunt they can do before every Tour de France is like, oh, look at this new kit that we've got. I think the kit's all right. It's, you know. Like a lot of the kids that we've been looking at, they're all very non-offensive. It's very yellow. It's just, there's nothing particularly crazy going on. Nothing that's going to be like rocking the boat. It's just another mid kit. I did see comments in the, in the comment section last week saying that the Bora kit is better than we were judging. Some people were putting it up for like at least a 7. I think we said it was like a 6.5 if you and an I did. So I can see where people are coming from because of based upon the other ones that have been released, or is like elevating itself because the quality this year doesn't seem particularly great. I don't think it's like the quality is low. I think the quality is just so concentrated in that middle section where like they're all like fine. There just aren't any standouts. I don't think there are any really terrible jerseys. I think they're all just perfectly fine and, and inoffensive. This is another one. I think it's a bit of a downgrade from the previous kits they've had. I think the old sort of the black stripe they had to the center gave the, the kit more structure and gave it more sort of purpose. But now without that, it feels a little bit sort of formless. I'm intrigued to see where they're going to go with the Tour de France kits. We saw uh, in 2021, they had the special one with all, it, you could get your name printed on the jersey and people did that. And the jersey was made up of supporters of Jumbo Visma's names. 2022, we had the wonderful AI-generated art piece one, which was uh, a blend of all these different sort of Dutch painters from the past. That was a fantastic kit. 2023, we had the Efteling collaboration. I didn't like that personally, but it was something a little bit different, and the Efteling aspect really added to it. So I think the Tour de France kit was almost more intriguing than this bland mid kit that they've uh, released uh, with this big launch that we had this week, which also... Closed the case in Kian Oudebroeks as he was in attendance at the team launch. 
uh, silencing all rumors, and the case seems to be officially closed as of the team launch this week, as Kianet Brooks officially moves to Visma Lisa Bike and severs his contract with Bora Hansgrohe. Tried to sabotage our get review here with Outer Brooks, just shoving Outer Brooks into the the chat well, review. Yeah, but I mean, not gonna lie, a, a lot of the chit chat from that team launch was all about Outer Brooks because he was at the event, and people were like, oh well, that now means it's done because he was wearing the jersey and so forth and got the microphone. So yeah, Keen Outer Brooks still get this name out here for the third week in a row. What other kits have been released? Was on a what have we got? Is it Palti Kometa? Ulti Cometa has not come out yet, but... Uh, Mariani. Oh, yeah, Moose. Oh, yeah, sorry, that was... Keep, keeping it well taught. Keeping it well taught. <laughs> <Mavistar. laughs> well, <laughs> true. <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> Even at this, it's true. Mobistar really said like it. It's a slight variation on that one from uh, last year. I think it's fine. They've got a couple of new sponsors on it. I quite like the effect they have with the jersey. It's just awfully similar to Astana. It's going to be quite hard to pick out in the bunch, I feel. I would actually dare to say that this, for me, breaches a a 7 out of 10 for me. I, I, I think that it is just a little bit better than some of the other ones that we've been seeing. So, well, yeah, when I saw it on Instagram, I was like, oh, actually, to be fair about this stuff, that's not bad. So, yeah, I, I'm all right with that. I prefer it to, like, Yumbo's on SRO. Vismas, Vismas yeah. user bikes. I'm still not used to that name. And I think anyone there is going to be used to that. No, I like, I like, really like the movie star kit. Have they changed um, kit providers as well? They're riding with Gobic. Gobic seems to have taken a lot of the kit market away from other kit providers. I also think Gobic is based in Spain. Um, they've really emerged with like out of COVID and I actually really commend Gobic. I said this the other week, I think they've done really good jobs with a lot of their kit designs over the past couple years. I will actually agree. I think this is the best World Tour kit we've had so far. The bar is low, but somebody has to lead the pack. I can already see the tier list that we're going to do later on. That middle section is going to be stacked. But yeah, we also had other kits. Uh, well, now going into non- non well tour kits, Bardiani CSF or whatever they're called now, VF Group. Yeah, they're not called the VF Group, Bardiani CSF, Faisana, rolls off the tongue. What were they called last year? They were called Green Project, yes. Uh, they've released their new kit. I actually quite like this. I think I just like the shade, like sort of like, how would you describe that? It's Aquamarine? I mean, we have to for our podcast listeners. And yeah, I, mean, I, mean, I, I commend you two for this. I commend you two for the descriptions because, yeah, I'm terrible with that. Says that it's green, I'm going to flip. Cause it's no, no, I think it's, I think it's aquamarine. It's a, it's a cyan teal kind of color palette for those listening on the podcast. Just imagine something like that. It doesn't really have any patterns going on, isn't it? Just quite a, it's just like a one color sort of thing, but I quite like that. I don't like it. It has a lot of sponsors on it. I wonder how much it would cost to get your name on there. Maybe we can let, get the Echelon Cycling Podcast on for 2025. It is verging into Drone Hopper kind of territory. That was a, that was a notoriously just like advertised kit, wasn't it? Yeah, these Italian pro continental teams need every sort of, every coin they can get. So I commend them for that. Even the uh, color, even the color of the jersey, there's a name. I think I got confused because this does look kind of like the Aeolula Cometa kit from this year. Like it's it's relatively similar in my eyes. I bet mm. I haven't looked at it today, but that's what I remember it looking like. So, mm, okay, I disagree. But um, should we hop over to Isn't Real Premier okay. Tech? They released their kits. I actually have really liked Isra Premier Tech's kits for the past couple of years. I think they've been really nice. This one is very tasteful. Quite bland, but very tasteful. Yeah, I quite like this. I'm a big fan of Israel's kits as well. How do you describe this here? This is a sort of calypso of different shades of blue. Um, you have one sleeve that is white and the other sleeve on the left-hand side of the riders that features three different shades of blue going from lighter to dark. And most of this jersey is in a sort of navy blue with one square being a lighter sort of turquoise color that has a fade into a sort of Oxford blue, if you know what I mean by that. Uh, there's also a sort of a band effect that, that, that goes through the jersey and right through the sponsor's logos through the chest. Yeah, it, I... I think it's it's very nice. Yeah. But I don't I, think it's like a standout, you know? I do think that it's better than, like, I don't know why I'm saying this Lisa bike because like the standard, but that's just kind of what I'm comparing it to this episode. I think it's better than Visma Lisa bikes. I mean, I like Visma's for the sake of the, the fact that it's it's just like an easy color to spot out in comparison to a lot of the rest of Peloton. Whereas this is just kind of like blues and whites, which are prevalent quite a lot of the place. But 
I think from a design standpoint, I prefer this. I think as well, the design is more daring. It, it's it's asymmetric. It's a little bit different where it feels like Vismalee Spike, it's symmetrical, doesn't really break any sort of conventions. It's quite bland. Israel Premier Tech, they've dared to do something a little bit different. And it's paid off, much as it has over the past few seasons. Totally agree. Yeah, it's my favorite kit so far uh, of this year. Maybe second Bora or the Stan. No, the Stano one. We had that weird thing at the bottom of the jersey. Uh, but yeah, we might as well move on. We can just stick with the Bisma, try and uh, postpone the cyclocross for you and sake. And uh, Visma and Lisa bike. Obviously, we also have a leaked Tour de France, a leaked, uh, whatever, a Tour de France, provisional Tour de France team. Let's call it that. That's probably easier. Yeah, the Tour de France team uh, has come out from Team Visma Lisa bike this week, as it has from UAE. We'll delve into that one afterwards. Um, but for Visma Lisa bike for next year's Tour de France, of course, it's being headed up by Jonas Vingo of Denmark with Sepp Kuss in support, Tish Benoit, Matteo Jorgensen, Stefan Kreiswijk. Christoph Laporte, Jan Tratnik, and Dylan Van Barler. Visma have had a history of releasing their teams very, very early on for the Tour de France, some even as early as March in the years gone by, so I'm not surprised they've been this confident and they planned it out this far away. In terms of, of, of the Giro, we believe that Eve de Brooks will be there alongside Val Van Aert, as well as Olaf Koy, who's set to make his Grand Tour debut in 2024. Very exciting stuff to see him teed up with Wild Van Aert, especially after the magic that they created at the, at the Tour of Britain in 2023. Uh, I can already see Patrick is very happy about that one, so I'll pass on to him to, to delve into this. I don't need to go and protest anymore. They listen to you. I did say I was going to go and protest and glue myself to my bus if I didn't send all I've coined to a Grand Tour. Am I doing it? I'm actually a little bit surprised. I, I actually thought that maybe I was going to have to go and be like, what are you guys doing? I think, honestly, Koi could be, with Wild on our side, he could pick up a few stages. It wouldn't surprise me. We've seen sprinters come through on Grand Tour debuts, especially as, yeah, just as sprinters, and they can really kind of catch people off guard. Like, Jonathan Milan this year was a big surprise, I think, for a lot of people. So, I think, honestly, Koi, considering that he's caught, you know, Wild Manart there as well, as just, I think that's going to be a good recipe. But I could be the more interesting thing is that Wild Manart isn't going to the tour. Is that a big downfall for this team? that they don't have like big versatile rider i know we've got other good riders but wow's really good that's the thing wow has delivered he's been there since 2019 particularly since 2020 he's been pivotal in those tour de france's particularly the past two that Jonas has won without him i think it's going to be a big shoes to fill um who's going to fill them i don't quite know i think mateo jorgensen's really going to step up to the plate as well jan tratnik but i don't think they quite have the same sort of characteristics that wild van Aert has i don't think they have the same engine that wild van Aert has jorgensen definitely probably is the guy in the team that could provide that the most maybe even dylan van Baal if, if he improves a little bit more in his climbing we saw glimpses of it at the final week of this year's tour de france he can be really strong in the mountains but i think it is going to be hard for visma to sort of fill that gap they've definitely filled it's a sad hole to fill but Nats van Hoydonk, I think his position has been sort of filled up by Tratnik to some extent. But that Wout role is going to be really tough to fill. And UAE is sending a barnstorming team sheet. Wout van Aert would have been really, really useful to sort of counteract that. Because there's no rider in UAE that's like Wout van Aert. That's always what UAE has struggled with. Is that they can match most of the riders on Visma's team. But there's quite literally nobody like him in the peloton. People will put examples in the comments, I'm sure. But whilst really just in a league of his own when it comes to versatility, and I think that Visma will miss that. But on the other side of the coin, I'm really happy that Wout's going to a different Grand Tour because I think that's just going to be, yeah, well, yeah, he's going to two and yeah, he's going to the Giro and the Vuelta. I like that in a semi, but Hobie's going to the Giro and it's just kind of a bit of a shake up, and I just prefer that. I'm also really happy to see Matteo Jorgensen get onto the Tour de France setup. He moved across. Uh, he's shown so much talent up there in top 10 in the Ronde of Landrum, been up there in Paris Nice, contending for Grand Tour stage wins, podium GCI World Tour stage races. He's a fantastic rider with a lot of talent. He's incredibly versatile. He could be the closest sort of Swiss Army knife that they could have. And for him to sort of jump into the team and already get that confidence to go into the Tour de France shows a lot of promise. Maybe he was a waste of talent at Movistar. Well, not a waste of talent, but he was not quite digging into his best reserves at Movistar. And I'm really, really intrigued to see how he's going to 
act as this super versatile teammate, he might be one of the stronger domestiques in this formation for the Tour de France next year. Obviously, you were going to say that. But he brings something here that like he's he's so good at multiple terrains he has that engine he can still climb with the best yes he's a little bit young and, and, and inexperienced but he's also been sort of up there with Movistar as their leader for sort of one week long stage race he's been in fighting in breakaways to try to win stages at Grand Tours I think he's 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 just he's got this sort of he's definitely show talent I think this is a brilliant signing for Visma and he will shine at the Tour de France I can feel it is this like a fellow redhead supporter is this your feeling uh, yeah, I mean, first point, like it's pointless with these Tour de France teams coming out in December because anyone can get injured or illnesses or whatever, the form can change. And I mean, while Van Aert, bringing him to the Tour, yeah, he's great and all that, but he also comes with a huge ego and they always have to try and get stages for him. And we saw in 2023, he didn't get anything. So it was a bit, yeah. No, I think they, they will be fine without him with the likes of Jorgensen, Van Baal and Tratnik. But then like, It'll be intriguing to see who's the first reserve. Because remember last year, the Giro, they had to completely switch around their team in the last minute because of COVID, because of illnesses and crashes. So it'll be intriguing to see who's going to be those sort of first and second reserves that might get flown into this squad. Just looking back on recent years, Stefan Kreiswijk is incredibly accident prone. He has crashed out of a number of Tour de France's, hasn't even made the Tour de France start list in the past couple of years. I don't think he's finished a Tour de France since COVID, but he's been on the start list of, of a number of them. But the one uh, who finished, third place bang that's how you do it that was before COVID in 2019 like like the, the still counts things. it still counts yeah, but, but but since then he's crashed out like of a number of Tour de, of Tour de France 22 23 well whatever but what the he, Giro 2026 <laughs> uh, to 16 yeah, the, there you go like for the for writer like him accident prone who knows what's going to happen if he's right out there at, at full force it'll be it'll be good to see him but those first reserves might be super important and what if wow van art is in fact the first reserve for that squad to jump in so uae as well they have their media day this week where, where the press got to speak to tade pogaccia and all the team staff there we found out a lot of details about tade's season of course, we mentioned the Giro target next year as well, which, which he is uh, super excited for. He's going to the Giro, the Tour de France, the Olympic Games, and the World Championships. When asked what his main goal was, he actually said the World Championships instead of the Giro and the Tour de France. With this, we also got the start list for the Tour de France. They were very open about who is going to be there. And it is as follows. Tade Pogacar leading up the squad with Juan Ayuso. Drow Almeida, Adam Yates, Havel Sivakov, Mark Solap, Tim Wellens, and Nils Pollitt. Guys, this, I think, is the strongest Tour de France squad we've had in since the Sky 2012 Tour de France. I think this is, a re like, in terms of pure mountain skills, the best in a long time. It is absolutely one of the strongest teams ever, but I don't think it makes a lot of sense. Who's getting the bead-ons? Nils Pollitt is hauling ass on the front the whole day. I just think when you got four climbers who have finished on the podium of the Grand Tour before, I mean, you got four domestiques. It's like a one-to-one -one ratio. It's like somebody's got to bend a knee. And who's that going to be? Is it going to be Almeida? Is it going to be a Yuzo? Is it going to be Yates? The Gatcha's coming in off of Giro. I feel like there's just a lot of question marks for me about this team. I don't think the harmony works. I don't think there's enough domestiques for the leaders that we got here. This is like Movistar, El Tridente, plus one. And the Tridente never really worked. So I don't see how four potential leaders is going to help them massively. You need like leader domestiques or is, or is that just too is that too pre-covid era of me i get what you mean and uae does have a history particularly in these one week long stage races to have a bit of a sort of leadership crisis but i think the team is is united around poggy i think it does depend how he comes out of the g dot the g is quite easy this year there's a thousand less meters of altitude than it usually has um there's a ten thousand it's quite a lot less altitude meters but i uh, mean one to thousands like one climb yeah, that's after I said that, I was like, hmm, I think it's actually less than that. It's um, it's quite a lot easier than the normal in terms of its altitude gain. And I, I think in terms of getting the beat on, Sivakov 
Wellens, Pollitz, those are those guys. Sivakov's moved here to be a domestique. He's super motivated for this. Tim Wellens, is, um, he was a domestique for Poggy quite closely at the beginning of last year. Those guys will, will be doing those roles. In the mountains, this could be a deadly team, but if Poggy's having an off day, who's the guy you work for? Who's the guy you send up the road? What do you do here? But in terms of that firepower of those four guys who finish on, on a Grand Tour podium, I think they outdo Vingegaard, Kursts. Kreiswag and Jorgensen. I think they're much stronger. But is Ayuso, Almeida's Yates together enough to crack Vinegar and Kuss? I don't know. Yates almost did it this year. If we added Almeida and, and Ayuso, that could definitely change the game. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, of all the squads, I could have the best shot of defeating Jonas. It's going to be this one because it could be a really interesting tour when you get to mountain stages where there's like breakaways and stuff and there's four potential UAE team Emirates leaders who all need to be marked by your Mobisma. And, you know, you're going to be seeing guys who are Grand Tour podium potential caliber riders launching into breakaways. They're not just going to be sat in like a reduced group of 10 climbers waiting to see who pops first. I think it's going to be aggressive racing, hopefully. I hope they don't all just sit and wait for Jonas to attack and then they all just get dropped because that would suck. Do you think UAE will send like, a user on a breakaway? I'd love to see it. Why would you bring so many riders here who are probably, and have in the past, just got dropped by Jonas like a stone? It's like, having, yeah, great, Jonas wins. UAE finish second, third, fourth, and fifth. Brilliant. But I'd, I would like to see even launch people in a breakaway, and I think they might do it. That could be the one thing which could defeat this Melissa bike. It's just the chaos of having so many leaders. And just not knowing who to mark. And they don't have someone like Valvenard to counter at, like to counter um counter these moves and go into the breakaway with Ayuso, where Valvenard could be he's really good in those breakaway kind of situations. But Jorgensen he's slipping into this neuro, we don't quite know how he's gonna act there. Yeah, exactly. Like no offense to Krauschberg, but he ain't gonna be able to counter. I don't but like are you gonna is it just like a man marking system? And then eventually you get to a point where Adam Yates has got up the road, and now you're going to need to work all day. But like you're saying, really chaotic. You're saying this squad is the best squad that could potentially crack Jonas Bingol. I would agree with you if Tadej Pogacar wasn't doing the Giro beforehand. Like, how many times have we seen riders fail doing the Giro and then coming to the Tour? It's not okay. No. Okay. Okay. But in the context that we have, this is the best possible team that they could set. Yeah. True. But like make Tade skip the tour uh, skip the Giro skip the Giro not the tour but if, if Tade cakewalks the Giro and he comes out of it relatively fresh in a kind of similar way to how Jonas I don't want to say cakewalk but he wasn't like attacking Pagacci he was just kind of like marking it and then he went into the world trip did really well yes I know Sepkus won but Jonas was still really strong there if Pagacci doesn't have the strongest competition at yeah. the Giro can he just easily not like, I don't know, rein it back a little bit and not do crazy Pagacha things in the final week. Did they just actually get a better prep for the tour? You and you said this for the Giro route because it's so heavy in the, in the first few stages. So if he gets like two, three minutes and then just marks moves, like it's not going to take that much out of him. Exactly. If there ever was a year to, to do the Giro tour double, I think it could be this year because it's very sort of that first week will be pivotal. Poggy could probably gain a minute and a half, maybe even two minutes if he's lucky in that first week. Follow the moves. And that final week isn't as mountainous as it usually is for the Giro. And those are the days that really take something out of you. And that's when you carry the fatigue through, through June, for instance, where I think the fatigue... Like, the hardest part of the Giro will probably peak at about stage 12. And from then onwards, it's kind of, it's it's not as hard as, as it usually is. So um, uh, what, what I'm thinking is that this is quite a good year to target both. And I think it's very strategic. And this squad is built around sort of giving Poggy a yellow brick road almost to get that yellow jersey. Is he strong enough to beat Jonas one-on-one? I don't think so. But this team could certainly try to crack this map. But particularly on those longer days through the mountains, like stage 19, I believe, of the tour, that Poggy struggles at. The days that go over 2,000 meters a couple times with multiple climbs, that like the, like the Granol, like the Cold Alas, that have cracked Poggy before. If he has this strong team around him, then I think he he's in a much better stead than he has been over the past two tours to France. Should we look at his Giro squad? You just don't want to talk about Cyclotrust. Well, okay. 
Let's talk about the GDOS coin because it's how it's yeah, well, it goes wrong to not talk about it. So the, the GDOS supporting Poggy, since it keeps getting mentioned, it is um, J. Vine, Rafa Micah, Felix Goldschartner, Rui Oliveira, Miguel Biel, Domin Novak, and Juan Seba Molano. Micah, Goldschartner, and Biel have been, they were in the Tour de France squad last year. Interesting to see that they haven't made the Tour squad this year. Molano, double Grand Tour sprint stage winner, is here as well. Uh, with his buddy Oliveira, and we're going to see Vine be a pivotal teammate, I think, in this GDOT. It's not strong for me. I think that it's... I know you're going right. In the context of, if you were to take this squad to the Tour, it's bad. If you take this squad to the Giro next year, against potentially not his same calibre of opposition, like a Jonas, it's fine. Because you don't need the A-lister squad to be taking on Simon Yates and Ita Brooks. You know, you don't need all that fluff around you. I think that this squad is going to be satisfactory for being able to accomplish the goal of winning the Giro. I think it's going to do it at like the, like the bare sort of minimum requirements. It's a bit like just putting in just enough work in your university degree to get a 2-1. Like you've just got 61% or something. And you're a massive. I also think as as well, this is um like they've put in like the bare amount, but that's that's useful for the Tour de France squad, is that they can put all their resources into that one when there's no Armada who's been sent to the Judo to help Poggy. And also the team might benefit from what could be a s like a tight battle for second, third, and fourth place where they control the race and they try to sort of fight for their G C positions. If that happens, then that could really benefit UAE, benefit Bogacha. Uh, looking forward to his Tour de France and resting those legs. Yeah, I think that's fine. Yeah, I think that's true. You're just so, basically relying on that fight for the other podium places and those teams will take control of the peloton, which means that UAE doesn't need to do anything. So why would you send a big A-list to squad when your team's not really going to need to do much anyway? Exactly. This is smart. You can and, then, okay. and get a stage win with Milano. Yeah, okay. Yeah. What advice? Yeah, Milano just seems to get into so many Grand Tour team. You know how Jacob Alula always send like a big sprint train and then there's just Chris Harper and Simon Yates on the end. UAE have done the opposite where they put made this big this GC team with Rui Oliveira and Milano just like on the end just like, okay, you two can just go and do your thing. I don't think they'll beat Koi though. No, I don't think nah, Milano's definitely not stronger than Koi. Koi has probably got Chi Clamino in the bag. I would say. I know Caleb Ewan's going, but I think Olaf Koi is better. Big question. Who's stronger for the Tour de France? Well, that's, Visma? That's the you segment. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, but we haven't given our definitive answer. I think on paper, it's definitely UAE, but in practice, maybe on, uh, Visma. Yeah. From a structured leadership standpoint, it's Visma. But from an absolute, like, holy moly, the names we have here, it's it's the UAE and the UAE have probably assembled the best Grand Tour squad on paper for like you say you were since like the Sky era like I can't honestly remember a squad where I was literally just like what is this some kind of joke I mean Jumbo Visma 2022 Roglic Ringo wow that Seb Cruz that was a pretty strong team that was true yeah but it was balanced yeah. out by Maybe Nata van Hoydonk, who is a strong domestique, but not like an A-lister. Um, Laporte, who was good, but not quite at that Grand Tour stage winning level. I think like these other guys are quite hard hitters in the squad. And to have four Grand Tour podium finishers, that's, that's pretty big. But I think... It, it, it's really tough because Visma have proved that they can, they, they just, their team dynamic seems to do something. They have these roles set out really well. But I think that brute force of UAE will be very tough. And for that, I'm going to say UAE is stronger. Oh, but I think you'll just all win still. <laughs> like, if you get what I mean. At least the tour is going to be a bit more exciting than potentially the second and third week of this tour in 2023. Anyway, we're not going to go well to, we're going to go cyclocross now. So you and you can have a nap or whatever. <laughs> did you guys watch it? I, well, Patrick, did you watch it? While well, Vinar and Macho Manipal did their first big show off of the 2023-2024 season, I thought it was quite good. It was in mold and then in mold. 
in Belgium in in the EXO or whatever it's called. Not the Super Prestige, not the World Cup. Match Van der Poel absolutely just put the pace on, destroyed a Wild Van Aert to some extent. Then did the same thing the next day in the UCI uh, World Cup in Antwerp. And then afterwards, uh, Wild Van Aert said that he he was taking it easier. You, you would say that if you hadn't won, I was just taking it easy. You would say that though, wouldn't you? Like, that's definitely what I'd say. I think... Matthew is looking like the best cyclocross rider in the world at the moment. No doubts about that. The whole kind of prelude that we had of Neuenhaus, he's a bit, Lars van der Haar has kind of all been forgotten about when the kind of the juggernauts come along. I mean, there was some interest in the UCI World Cup on the Saturday. Match Bandport had a bad start and uh, he he was quite far down the field. So he had to actually make his way up on a course that was quite yeah. sandy and not that technical, but he it took him like one lap and then he was already in the lead again. So it's it's, it's just crazy. Pitcock went down. Yes, yeah. Well, they were like together, which goes to show that Van der Poel is definitely stronger than Pitcock at the moment. I mean, it's, it's not like that was necessarily like in question. I guess, but that's been put to bed because Pitcock did not finish as well as Van der Poel did. People have been saying that we should just make Cyclocross more interesting by giving everybody a lap advantage on Van der Poel and then set him off going, and then maybe that might, like, in, in a handicap star race, that might work better. Cyclocross right now feels a lot like Formula 1. It's like, there's a Dutch guy, you can put him anywhere in the field and he will win by the end, and... Uh, I mean, any Max Verstappen fans listening, Match Van Poel beat him for Sportsman of the Year in the Netherlands, so in your oh, face. I'm not sure if I agree with that. Totally. They're both born in Belgium and raised in Belgium, but but compete for the Netherlands, and they both have famous fathers who are quite big personalities in the sport. There you go. That is the same person. I mean, yeah. Uh, I admit that Bounce was stopping though, and I'd literally done the most, probably the most dominant season ever. And I, oh, yeah, true. You won every race by like what, three or four, and you like got beaten by some geezer on two wheels. But he but didn't win Paro Bay. He didn't win Paro Bay. Well, that's very true. Verstappen would not win Rubert. Did Verstappen win it in 2021? The Dutch sportsman of the year. We had Max Verstappen win the last two years. So, yeah. Oh, okay. There we go. Well, All right, there you go. Variety. Yeah, exactly. In that case, you can't win everything, you know. Mancha Wannapol won it in 2019, Tom Dumoulin in 2017, Max Verstappen in 2016. But anyway, cycling. <laughs> uh, cyclocross, yeah. Uh, I mean... Van der Poel. Yeah. Which would beat Wild Van Aert, despite the fact that he had a bad start. Wild Van Aert can totally say he's taking it easy for as long as he wants. But um, he's, he's, got, he's got ground to make up. Simple as that. There was a lot of Wild Van Aert fans in the comments saying that he was going 90% and uh, that's why and Match Van Paul was going 95% but I mean that doesn't mean anything it's I about winning a lot of excuses like why I've tapped into my whoop or something what my guy what is going on here oh while it was doing 90% Van Paul was doing 95 because I could see where he was positioned on his saddle but piss oh man like you don't know what people are doing outside of what they tell us while Renal was up there towards the uh, front end when Machu Van Paul had had like to come back through the field and he should have gone to the front and absolutely drilled an advantage but he didn't so exactly because he was holding it to 90% Scott he was just treating it as a train as a training ride he had so, to so it was just a train it's not actually about to race just for whatever reason because it makes yeah because that makes a lot of sense doesn't it the simple fact of the matter is at the moment Matthew Van der Poel is better than Wout Van Aert in cyclocross 151 victories so far or 52 151 I think mm. 52 yeah I mean it's crazy while well, the women's women's Femme Van Ampel won and who cool. it's what her like I don't know, 11, 12, 13, whatever victory of the season, she turns up, she wins. She'll probably win the Tour de France fan next year as well, just for like good measure. And then the Dutch woman dominating in sport. Well, dominating cycling. So, there you <laughs> And it was rounded out by Lucinda Brandt and Puck Pietzer, who are both also Dutch. So, there you go. Even the under 23 <laughs> men's with uh, Del Grosso, who's also Dutch. So, Dutch everywhere. Really? Anyway. 
Walter. The Walter route for 2024 was announced. From Lisbon to Madrid, yes, Portugal is on the agenda uh, with a rather underwhelming Grand Depart, or whatever they will call it in Spanish. It begins with a 12 kilometer long individual time trial. Then we have a couple of sort of meh, welter, hilly stroke flat stages. Uh, we go to the mountains on stage four and continue that theme into the end of the first week of racing. And the second week of racing has yet more mountains. It's quite a tough welter route, I will say this. But I think, I mean, the toughest mountains to come are in the final week with the Lagos de Covadonga on stage 16 and a biblical, biblical stage on stage 20 to Picon Blanco. And to round things out, the world is going to finish with a time trial. Praise the Lord above. There's no Grand Tour stage I hate more than the Madrid sprint stage. So I'm glad we have the Vuelta ending with an individual time trial. Who knows what kind of route this Buelta could suit. To be honest, the Buelta is kind of an afterthought for many people. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty open, isn't it? I will admit, the Madrid sprint this year was better because of that one that breakaway group, which is the exception to the rule. I will say, though, on balance, this route sucks. It just... There we have it. Just, it just is. Really? I just Why? don't like it. Outside of stage 20... I look at it and, and the Covadonga and there's like one other stage in there. I'm like, there's three stages which I'm interested in. And then there's just a lot of breakaway stages, which is very well to S. There's a lot of medium stages. I'm like, that's just a breakaway. Great. There'll be a big breakaway formation phase. Somebody will solo off with 20Ks to go. Mm. Brilliant. Just like Leonard Kemner style. There's not enough intrigue for me in like the first week. Like you need to hang around for a hell of a long time to get something out of this race by the looks of things look why well, like you say grand par, very underwhelming yeah cause a tt in there i like that they don't have the sprint as well i do like that but oh my word it is root of the three grand tours next year this is the one i'm not looking forward to the least i don't know that's very like down downward thinking but I just, it's really not tickling my fancy yeah i agree with that i agree like uh I mean, I just think it's so pointless when they have it. Like, we've already had the Giro one. We've already had the tour uh, route releases. Why don't you have it, like, closer to the tour so at least you can get some hype? Like, nobody really cared about this, to be honest. No, I, I think people were intrigued about how they're going to do the Lisbon to the beginning of the race and it ended up be, being a time trial lisbon is a city filled with short steep cobble climbs and i was really hoping that they would include some but they haven't and the portuguese fans are going to be um, really enthusiastic we see that a lot in cycling but yeah i mean this is typical Vuelta. i mean yeah. the steam has run out even now and it, the steam will definitely be running out by the end of august next year when this race starts but it is a grand tour return for egan bernal we believe apart from him we don't really have many other confirmed riders uh we believe almeida yates are going to be there and probably Enric mass rui costa as well you guys i imagine well he's riding for ef nowadays yeah exactly he's going to be there and i mean any world tour team with a portuguese rider slot them into your start list bridge state well the fact of fact of there's very few sprint stages is a positive because as we all know sprint stages are that they're all right but that novelty runs out quite quickly but sprint stages at the Buelta are a little bit more sort of like wild cardy so i think that kind of adds a little bit more of an element to it but like yeah. okay three maximum in the Buelta. but i'm glad they got rid of the madrid one because that one is yeah you know, so unnecessary no one cares like at that point i'm desperate for the grand tour season to end so i'm glad we're finishing with the tt so that we finally have some like gc intrigue particularly because we have the rome sprint finish at the gdon point on the stage as well we're keeping it going if what else is they release add scott nothing yeah nothing I don't already care about it i mean <laughs> right <of> the week. <laughs> yeah i mean we had some transfer we we should probably touch on that before uh Malaysia, uh we were speaking about right. him, the under 23 world time trial champion confirmed to be going to movie stuff after released from dsm or whatever you say quite surprising no another rider breaking his contract from dsm early which seems to be a big trend among many riders but yeah and even going to Movistar, it's interesting Movistar made some some pretty interesting signings over the past 12 months dare i say quite a lot of interesting italians are going to matter Quintana. Oh yeah, that as well, yeah. I do find it interesting that the under-23 TT jump has gone to a team which is just rubbish. They're time-trialing. Very sure. 
what is the last time trial they won? Or was it like uh, Alex Dowsett back in the Giro in 2013? Mm-hmm. To, to be fair, uh, they've won team time trials at the Vuelta. Wow. Is that good? Vera Quintana won the mountain time trial at Monte Grappa, the Giro in 2014. Oh, good. I just found it all. But he's going to a place which isn't renowned for TT success. Yeah. But maybe that's not what he's interested in. Maybe he wants to be a bit more than just a TT person, which, is, to be fair, that's a very good move. So I'm glad he's gone somewhere at least. Keeping it with the younger guys, Marco Brenner as well, was on Team DSM Firmini. He's heading over to Tudor Pro Cycling in a pretty quiet transfer. And uh, Giovanni Carboni, a rider I have really liked over the past couple of years. He's made a huge step down. He's going to the continental level next year, which is a bit of a shame. Also, uh, Pierre-André Cote, who was on the Hema Powered Health squad that folded it at the end of the year. He's had a lifeline with Israel Premier Tech at the last minute. A team which, of course, has Quebec roots as the team's owner is a Israeli Quebecois billionaire. Anyway, right over the weekend, I mean, there's quite a selection to choose from. I mean, any fans of the Arab Road Cycling Championships, Algeria absolutely dominated the men's race 1-2-3 in the sprint in front of Morocco. Yeah, cyclocross to choose from as well. You've also got the Vuelta Ciclismo International at Costa Rica. So guys, you have a plethora of riders to choose from this week. I am going to choose... For, for kind of the nostalgia's sake of what could have been for this rider's career, I will choose Juan Diego Alba, who is currently leading the Vuelta Ciclista Internacional Costa Rica. He came third in the Baby Giro in like 2019. He was signed to Bobby Star. It was that one Giro, Baby Giro where it was him, Ida Rubio, and Adelia or something like that. And him and Adelia just dropped to the depths of nothingness. And I am calling back this name because he is leading this prestigious race. And I am going to put his name as in lights for where they never quite managed to sail in his career. So well done, Juan Diego Alba. You are my rider of the week. I am also going for a rogue Latin American rider who was scouted by Gianni Savio, much like the writer you just mentioned, Alba. I'm going for Kevin Rivera, who's actually from Costa Rica. He was scouted by Gianni Savio a number of years back. Signed on to Andrani in 2017. Bear in mind, this is also the time that Egan Bernal was picked up by Gianni Savio, and he had sort of this like great scouting ability for kids from like Latin America would bring them over to Italy and would give them sort of European cycling treatment. And this guy was right rising through the ranks, then moved to where well, he was on Bardiani, then moved to Gazprom in 2022, which is a Russian-Italian team that got their UCI license stripped when the war broke out in Ukraine. And since then, his career has taken a huge downturn. Could not find a team for the rest of 2022 and uh, didn't have a team until relatively recently. And now he has taken a stage and finished second on one of the stages at Buelta, Costa Rica. And he's uh, looking to probably finish on the podium at that race. So good to get Kevin Rivera back on the map. And maybe we can get him back in Europe after what was a pretty sudden drop off the, the cycling map after Gazprom were stripped of their UCI license. Sorry, that was a long story. Before Scott says his rider week, I want to draw attention to stage eight of the Tour of Costa Rica, which has a 39.4 kilometer. 6% 6% climb over 3,000 meters, where the stage was fought out between three riders, no, four riders, who literally broke away on that climb and then were just solo for the, well, whatever, just for the next two thirds of the stage. A 3,000 meter climb. Take notes, Walter. Jordan, sure, I thought there's more Costa Rican riders with like terrain like that. We only really have Amador that. Yeah. Broke into. Granto success. Infant <laughs> Rivera. Yeah, but yes. has he finished fourth at the Giro? No. No. That's true. Maybe he will. This is kind of the boost to his confidence right of the week and to do well at his home race. Yeah, it's good to see all these like uh, South American races popping up. Oh, my right of the week. Uh, well, I was going to go for Machu Vanderpool, but that seems a bit too, too easy. Uh, I think. Mean, I kind of want to, but Machu Vanderpool winning, winning a cycle cross race isn't that special. So despite it being 152, 51, uh, I've got to go for Hamza, who won the Arab Road Cycling Championships. I wonder if they're, they're going to get a jersey for that, because uh, 
Not strictly a consummate, but uh, Hamza, you're my writer of the week. So we'll see what all these three guys, if they're going to be elevating to the world tour or again, like Albert. But yeah, that's basically it for number 48 of the Echelon Cycling Podcast. Make sure to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel here on, on YouTube. And if you haven't already, check out Spotify as well. And this week, I promise I'll leave all the Twitter accounts down in the description. So if you want to see what Patrick, you and all myself think about cycling on Twitter, but with that, thank you very much for watching and or listening, and we will see you next week. And Merry Christmas, of course. Oh, yes. It was the night before Christmas. <laughs>